Before we get into the content, um, today we're going to be talking a lot about displacement and resiliency. And so to begin, I first want to acknowledge the land we're on. Wherever you are zooming in from, you are on indigenous land. Mohai itself is located in Seattle on the historic and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and all Coast Salish people. And we want to acknowledge the forced displacement of native communities from this land while honoring the endurance of the Duwamish people who still live here. Telling stories of displacement is not complete without talking about the indigenous people who have lived here in the past and still live and make Seattle the place it is today. So now I want to turn to our topic, History Cafe, Resilience Past and Present in the Chinatown International District and introduce our two fabulous speakers. So I'm so happy you have agreed to join us this evening. So first of all, Cynthia Brothers. Cynthia Brothers is the founder of Vanishing Seattle, a project that documents the displaced and disappearing institutions, small businesses and cultures of Seattle and celebrates the spaces and communities that give this city its soul. Cynthia is also a founding member of the anti-displacement organizing group, Chinatown International District, CID Coalition, Coalition aka Humbows Not Hotels. Our second speaker is Marilyn Herrera, a community organizer with the Chinatown International District Coalition, or hashtag Humbows Not Hotels. With a background in policy and planning, Marlon is dedicated to justice, equity, and self-determination for the CID and the rest of the Coast Salish lands. Marlon is also a SAM transit, transit project manager and a Seattle Parks Commissioner. Thank you both so much for, in, for joining us tonight and um, being here to spread some knowledge. All right, well, thank you, uh, Rachel and to Mohai for having myself and Marlon on today. Um, we're just really excited to share some more with y'all about the work of CID Coalition and um, about the history of the Chinatown International District. So thank you all for zooming in this evening. Um, so we thought that we would start out with some historical grounding um, just to start off the conversation. And I think the first point I really wanted to drive home is just the specialness and uniqueness of the Chinatown International District community. It's the only place in the continental US where Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, Vietnamese, and black and indigenous folks settled together and built one neighborhood. And um, we'll also give you a brief overview of the history of the international district, why it looks like it does today, the various forms of exclusion and displacement and community responses to that past and present. And um, we do want to say that, you know, this is not a comprehensive history, of course. Um, but if you're interested in learning more, we'll share some recommended readings uh, towards the end of the presentation. And um, we'd also invite folks to, as we're talking about issues of displacement, um, uh, we'd invite you all to think about displacement beyond just the physical sense, but on a more holistic level that includes um, how it affects identity, culture, um, the social fabric and connections, um, folks' sense of home and belonging, and also who it serves to benefit and who is um, disadvantaged and disenfranchised. Um, so with some of that background context, I'm going to hand it over to Marlon. Thanks, Cynthia. I uh, also want to echo what you said and thank the Museum of History and Industry for having us today. I'm super excited to be talking today and got mad respect for what Mohai does. Uh, when it comes to talking about the CID, uh, one thing that Rachel mentioned that's really important to note is yes, that uh, we are on cultural, ancestral, and unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples, and most specifically the Duwamish, Suquamish, and all Coast Salish tribes. Um, when we talk about displacement, one thing uh, many of you may already know is the very first thing city council did when the city of Seattle incorporated was ban the Duwamish from living in the city proper. This set the stage for a legacy of discrimination to follow, including mob violence that drove out the Chinese American laborers in the 1880s, um, all the way to the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, and the exclusion of people of color from white neighborhoods uh, through redlining and racial restriction covenants in the 60s. These are all things we're gonna dive into while we provide a bit of a historical grounding what happens in the CID. And it's important to note that this pattern of dispossession from land, community, and home continues to this very day. 
I did mention that um, the Chinese settlers originally came to Seattle in the Pacific Northwest and settled here in the 1850s and 1860s. Um, in 1882, shortly after the city of Seattle was actually incorporated, um, the mobs against Chinese laborers uh, led the city council to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which happened after, uh, which shortly afterwards happened uh, an anti-Chinese riot in 1866. It's also important to note that the CID, the Chinatown International District, that you all love and enjoy today is the third one to have happened. The first one is what you're looking at on the screen today and was actually built over the waterfront um, in what now would be up to First Avenue um, on the central waterfront. Uh, obviously, since then, uh, we filled in the land with trash and as many of you know, sawdust from Yesler's Mill to create the land we see today that actually goes all the way to the Coleman Dock in the piers. Eventually, the second Chinatown was established farner inland. Uh, here's a little picture of kind of the vicinity, including the current CID from 1917. Short. Eventually, um, the second Chinatown was in Pioneer Square, and that was displaced again to where the Chinatown is today, where you can see it from this picture. And you can see Elliott Bay in the background, King Street Station, and Yesler Tower. I mean, the Smith Tower on Yesler Way. Um, Yes, and Japanese settlers uh, began arriving at the turn of the century and established Nihonmachi, which is Japantown, from 4th Avenue along Main Street to 7th Avenue, which is now present-day Dearborn Street. And they were, again, displaced uh, to where they are today. But um, today, what you see as Nihonmachi is actually very different from what it was before. The Japanese community actually extended all the way north to First Hill to what is now the southern tip of, of Seattle University. Now I'm going to turn it over to Cynthia to talk about what happened after the turn of the century. Thanks, Marlon. Um, yeah, so around the 1920s, uh, Filipino Americans began arriving. Um, a lot were coming as contract laborers in the agricultural and salmon agricultural industry and to work in the salmon canneries. And by the 1930s, uh, Manila Town had been established near the corner of Maynard and King. And um, I would definitely recommend checking out the Filipino American History Kiosk that's down on 6th and King right now. Um, and around that time, there were a series of um, overlapping and uh, racially segregationist policies that dictated where people could and could not live. Um, so there were the alien land laws in Washington state. Um, uh, I believe the first one was instituted in 1921 and it barred non-white immigrants from buying, owning, or leasing land. And that was not formally repealed until 1967. There were also racially restrictive covenants um, that were put in place around the 20s, quite common through the 40s and up until the late 60s. Um, some homes might actually still have them in their deeds. And these are deed restrictions that were inserted by homeowner groups and real estate agents specifying uh, whites and Caucasians only or prohibiting people of color from buying or renting in certain areas. And there's also the practice of redlining um, in central Seattle, so Central District, uh, International District, Beacon Hill. And redlining was a practice where banks would often deny home loans or charge higher interest rates to people of color, particularly to African Americans. Um, and if you look on this map, I think this is a redlining map from uh, the mid 30s where there's like literally a red um, line drawn on the map um, that would label parts of the city as hazardous to lenders. And a related practice to redlining was disinvestment where banks would take savings from residents of a red line area, but then deny loans to that same community. So what ended up happening is that the Central District and the Chinatown International District were just about the only neighborhood uh, neighborhoods where African Americans and Asian Americans and some of the Jewish population could live. And you still see, you know, patterns of this today in the way that, you know, demographically um, uh, the city is, is uh, laid out now. Um, in spite of all this, red line communities responded with resistance and resilience and creativity. They created their own close-knit social networks and services, churches, small businesses, um, arts and culture. They built vibrant and largely self-reliant multiracial neighborhoods. Um, 
And then in 1942, during World War II, um, Executive Order uh, 9906 um, was issued, and that was uh, the federal government forcibly displacing and incarcerating the Japanese American community. Um, so at that time, it was reported that about a fifth of the stores in the International District were vacant or for rent. And there's a picture here um, of Jackson Street um, and the Higo store with its uh, windows boarded up um, due to um, its owners being incarcerated. And then many of the families who uh, managed or worked in the shops never returned to Seattle after they left the incarceration camps. And uh, many of the Japanese American properties and businesses were later taken over by non-Japanese folks. Um, also around this time, African Americans were moving to Seattle during the Great Migration, many from the South, to work in the war industry during World War II. And they bought homes and opened businesses in the ID, including many famous jazz clubs that were um, running up and down Jackson. Also around this time, one of the neighborhood's first grassroots advocacy organizations formed in 1946. That was called the Jackson Street Community Council. And that was made up of Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, and African-American professionals and community leaders. And that was a, um, the Jackson Street Community Council was a early model for inter-ethnic collaboration. And around the 50s and 60s, there was the um, construction of I-5 and the Jackson Street Community Council did organize against that because it was proposed to cut through the International District. Um, as we know, <laughs> I-5 still got built, um, although they were able to, um, I think, mitigate um, some of the most um, disastrous aspects of that development, but it was still um, uh, really, yeah, I mean, it still cut the community in half and in the process destroyed thousands of homes and churches and small businesses and uh, displaced a lot of the families in the International District further south. So then in the late 60s and early 70s, there was the proposed construction of the Kingdom Stadium. And uh, the conversation and the fight around that exposed a lot of um, inadequate uh, social services, a lack of decent housing, and just continuing discrimination and neglect in the International District. And that whole battle around the kingdom played a really important role in galvanizing the local Pan-Asian movement and continuing that multiracial organizing. Um, this included folks like Uncle Bob Santos and the Gang of Four. That's uh, also Larry Gossett, Bernie White Bear, and Roberto Maestas. And there's a slide here of Larry Gossett speaking to um, a crowd during a, a kingdom protest. And, you know, folks were really concerned that the building of the kingdom would put a great deal of development pressure on neighborhoods south of downtown and threaten to displace longtime residents and lead to rising property values. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that there's um, another protest around the construction of the kingdom and a confrontation between, it looks like, between um, the police and the protesters. Um, but as a result of this, residents got organized and organizations were formed um, that worked towards preserving affordable housing and historic character of the district, uh, calling for things like exemptions to the city's new zoning laws. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's a picture of community members that are gathered at a housing meeting. Um, and then as a result of building this people power, all of this organizing ultimately won mitigation funds and um, established the services and low income housing and nonprofits that are still serving the community today. Uh, one example of that is the Danny Wu Garden. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's a picture of the Danny Wu Garden um, at its dedication in 1977. Um, that's still in use today. It's got over 100 plots of land that are cared for by the neighborhood's elderly and immigrant and low income residents. And um, one, one piece out of this, uh, this movement and this organizing that I did want to lift up is that um, preservation of the International District um, was a big part of it. And one thing that was established in 1973 was the International Special Review District, or the ISRD. And their charge is basically to promote and preserve the cultural, economic, and historical features of the neighborhood 
particularly those features derived from its Asian American heritage. And Marlon will share um, a bit more with you later about how the CID coalition um, engages in that ISRD space and centers a lot of our work in that space um, currently. Um, and then following 1975, after uh, the fall of Saigon, immigrants from Vietnam and Southeast Asia established Seattle's Little Saigon, east of I-5. And then in the decades following, the CID community continued to organize and successfully fought off various threats, things around environmental racism, like efforts of the city to put garbage burning facilities and um, a massive intermodal transportation center in the international district, um, fought off chain restaurants, and also, also successfully preserved and rehabilitated old, ho old hotels that became low-income housing. Uh, so Marlon, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Cynthia. And so now moving into the 21st century, or what little of it has happened so far, uh, we very much know that Seattle is in another boom period, and this is fueled largely by the tech industry that attracts a lot of high income earners, large corporations, and ultimately luxury developers and speculative real estate investors into our community. As housing prices and land value increase, and while our supply of housing is frankly constrained while demand is skyrocketing, we've seen communities of color pushed out of the very neighborhoods that they are red light and forced into where decades and generations of resilience to build the communities that we treasure so deeply today are now being threatened by another wave, um, this time in the form of gentrification and displacement. CID, um, according to the last um, comprehensive plan put out by the city of Seattle's Office of Planning, notes that we are at the highest risk for displacement out of the entire city, uh, largely because we're south of downtown. These properties um, on it are very close to major attractions, uh, employment hubs, transportation centers, and where we are today is largely because of decisions that were happened in the past that were very explicitly racist. Now, uh, rapidly rising costs um, in terms of land, uh, it's not just that. We know that it's food, services, everything, uh, down to our haircuts. Uh, during all of this, a strategy the last mayoral administration tried to do was to upzone a lot of the Chinatown International District uh, to build more housing, but in exchange for the extra height, developers had to pay a little bit into an affordable housing fund or include some affordable housing inside those existing units. Um, I want to note that the median income in the Chinatown International District is about 30,000 when Seattle's median income is 90. So those affordable housing units that are anchored to the city median income really just don't serve our community while delivering those affordable housing units rely on the forces that uh, completely crush our small businesses and our low income neighbors that have treasured this place for generations. Uh, for example, single residence occupancy hotels in the CID, which historically housed Im immigrant workers, families, and our elders, are now being removed and flipped, displacing tenants not only from their apartments, but from the cultural, linguistic, and social supports they have in the CID. And it's important to note that the CID has these culturally appropriate services and these small businesses that serve our Pan-Asian community, uh, not because of pure luck, but because past generations have forced them in there and my ancestors and Cynthia's ancestors who lived before us uh, created this community that is self-reliant and uh, for the people who live there in spite of all the forces working against us. Now, rising commercial rents also pushes out all these small businesses with mom and pops who desperately rely on the CID and the people in there for the self-sustaining economy where I think every dollar that gets spent gets flipped three times in the neighborhood before leaving the CID. Uh, we are well aware that the kingdom was replaced by two new stadiums. Uh, new hotels are popping up everywhere, proposed inside the CID even. And expansion of the transportation hubs, uh, while it is continuing to also put more displacement gentrification pressure on the neighborhood, we're also seeing an influx of chain restaurants, which the past generation has fought so desperately against to keep McDonald's out. But now they're taking the form of things like 85 degrees Celsius, Celsius Bakery Cafe and bigger chains, which again are threatening our mom and pops that are very much anchored in this neighborhood. Uh, now, uh, I know there's uh, some articles out there, including by our own Seattle Times, who say that gentrification shouldn't be much of a concern. But it's important to note that in our neighborhood, the census data shows that between 2010 and 2017, the Asian Pacific Islander population on the CID has decreased 
by 21%. Meanwhile, the white population has increased by 54%. In 2017, a study by the national CAPACD found that 10% of low-income API families in the CID, which is about over 350 families, were displaced between 2000 and 2014. And then I also mentioned, I just want to reiterate that a lot of the seniors in the neighborhood, because we are, uh, we have a lot more elders than a lot of Seattle, uh, rely on Social Security and SSI. Um, the median income in Seattle is 93500 and seems to be going up nonstop. And in the CID, our median income is just about 30000 um, This loss of identity in a neighborhood that the working class has been uh, forced into and has thrived despite everything against them. This intergenerational and multicultural community uh, is very much a threat, which is uh, not just displacement, but the broader talk about gentrification and what this is worth to us. Now I want to pass it over to Cynthia, who uh, can talk about a little bit the CID coalition slash Humbass Not Hotels. Thanks, Marlon. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Marlon for um, designing this awesome CID coalition logo behind me. <laughs> I'm trying to like by the way, a little bit so you can see it's full glory. Um, yeah, so Chinatown International District, CID Coalition, aka Humbells Not Hotels. Um, that's kind of a nod to the legacy of Uncle Bob Santos, who wrote a book um, called Humbells Not Hot Dogs um, about his work, you know, around the kingdom and just advocating for community and helping to establish a lot of services we have today. So we wanted to pay tribute to um, Uncle Bob and our activist predecessors um, and also acknowledge that, you know, we're organizing still around a lot of these same issues. Um, so the CID coalition itself formed in early 2017 in response to learning about a proposed 17 story Marriott hotel um, that was going to be built on 8th and Lane, which is, um, a corner where a lot of uh, community services are that are um, that were very hard fought for by our activist predecessors and that are serving a lot of the most vulnerable in our community. Um, there's a clinic there. There's a assisted living center where my grandma lives. There's a child care center. Um, there's other low income housing. And the kicker of all this was that um, some of the health and service providers in the neighborhood had tried to buy that property so they could build um, uh, an aging in place um, uh, facility for elders and they were outbid by this for-profit hotel developer. And that is an increasing pattern that we've seen happen multiple times um, in the international district. Um, in terms of who is in the CID coalition, um, we're an all volunteer grassroots group, uh, grassroots group of folks who live and work in the ID or have family who live and work there or, you know, in any way consider it our cultural home. And uh, in a nutshell, we, the issues we work on are um, around anti-displacement and cultural preservation and believing that um, uh, self-determination um, should be happening and the community should be involved in all decisions that are impacting uh, the neighborhood. Um, so there's a picture of uh, yeah one of our one of our protests and there's our banner and some of our members and uh, partners there. Um, there's another image of uh, CAD coalition members and friends at uh, we have the 2017 um, town hall um, around the up zone and folks are holding up signs that say red line out displacement. Um, we need community ownership. We won't be forced out. And if you wanna go to the next slide, um, this is a picture of a protest I believe last year um, against Coda Condominiums, which is on Washington and Fifth um, in Nihonmachi. And this is a picture of seniors, many of whom live in uh, Hirabayashi Place, which is right next door to where Coda Condos is um, being built. And Coda Condos is a luxury high rise. The condos are priced at over a million dollars. Parking spots are like $75,000. 
Um, so uh, yeah, residents of the CID and residents of Hirabayashi Place were protesting like the immediate negative impact of having that high rise next to them. Um, a lot of them were, you know, getting sick from the construction we learned afterwards and just um, trying to fight against the general threat of displacement and gentrification that these type of luxury developments uh, trigger. And we, the CAD Coalition, is about building intergenerational and intercultural community-based power um, for neighborhood resilience. And um, I'll hand it back to you, Marlon. Cool. Thanks, Cynthia. I also want to give a, a shout out to, I saw Sharon Chang is on the line. Uh, she's a photographer in a community who takes these amazing photos. And, hey, Sharon. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we, the CID Coalition, um, are not just focused on what happens inside our neighborhood, because that's such a small piece of the big story and all these forces that are against us. Uh, we are building solidarity across the entire South End. That means those don't displace the South End signs you've seen in Beacon Hill and the historically redlined communities. We've been working with neighborhood groups uh, to try to create a bigger strategy on how we can grow as a city uh, without displacing these historically redlined and historically disadvantaged communities and to preserve what we've fought so hard for in the past. Uh, we also have First Mobile Home Park is another great example where one of the predatory developers in our neighborhood um, was also trying to redevelop a uh, mobile home park in SeaTac uh, where he, they were using very aggressive tactics against their tenants and we showed up and we did demonstrations at the developer's church and we want to recognize that this issue is not just within our neighborhood of the Coast Salish lands but this is truly a global issue in our world. Uh, be Thanks to that, some of our members have also been um, organizing uh, cross-continentally with other Chinatowns in Canada and the United States. I had the pleasure of attending two of the gatherings, one of them here in Seattle and another in New York City a few months ago. And uh, we're really just trying to share information, gain knowledge and strategies that work and really share um, and build power to fight for something that our ancestors have been fighting for for so long. Now, an example of a campaign we're doing locally is Save Bush Garden. You can see a photo here of one of our demonstrations uh, during when the special review district came down and their members did a site inspection of the building. Uh, we want to show up and uh, really express that this still very much matters to our community. Uh, my father is an immigrant from the Philippines and uh, in his early days, he recounts having a lot of meetings and dinners and happy hours at Bush Garden. Uh, Uncle Bob Santos, we saw earlier, this was his, one of his big hangouts. And it's not to mention that this building previously was a single residency occupancy hotel, which was in a sense, um, the West Coast version of a tenement. And this building has a lot of history and a lot of continuing uh, value to our community. And it's just frustrating to see that there's a proposal to turn into luxury condominiums and display something we treasure so much. And uh, Save Bush Garden, um, it's not just fighting for 100 years of Asian American history um, against the developer vibrant cities. Uh, we're also mobilizing against them. Alley Developers Community Building Events is a big one. We do drag bingos, karaoke nights, um, just happy hours. We meet there every Monday. And here's a big one we did with Historic Seattle, where we gathered a lot of the people who have mad love for Bush Garden to just show up and say that, yes, my heart is still full and this place matters to us. And redevelopment for predatory speculation is not the future we want to see. Now, um, we also presented, oh, there's Uncle Bob Santos, a cutout of him for all of y'all karaoke fans. Um, this is present at the Bush Garden stage. Uh, we were thankful to have his cutout at the uh, Heart Bomb Bush Garden event. And uh, one thing we also want to note is that we aren't necessarily anti-displacement, I mean, anti-development. We need more affordable housing. We need more green space. We need clean, affordable transportation that works for everyone. All these things can't happen without development. So we presented a, an alternative vision of what this could look like for um, that respects the history of our community and builds what our ancestors fought so hard to create. Now, with that, I want to turn it over back to Cynthia to talk about what this means in the context of COVID-19. Thanks, Marlon. And I will, um, I've been, yeah, I don't know if y'all peep my uh, Save Bush Garden shirt, <laughs> also designed by Marlon. Thank you. 
And I think that we have um, these t-shirts uh, for sale on our website, <laughs> CIDcoalition.com. And um, yeah, proceeds from that go to support the organizing work and the Save Bush Garden campaign. Um, and they look pretty sweet. So yeah, you can find them on our website. Um, yeah, so shifting gears to um, touch upon uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the International District. I mean, it goes without saying that um, uh, the COVID's impact has been hard on everyone, but it's uh, disproportionately hit communities of color the hardest. Um, and for the International District, it was hit especially hard and especially early. Um, so even back in January, small businesses were um, seeing a decline in their patronage due to a lot of racist rhetoric and Trump calling it the Chinese virus and all this. Um, some small businesses said that they'd seen their business go down 70% or more. And this was well before, this was like at least a month before the stay at home order was implemented. Um, there's also been a huge spike in anti-Asian racism and anti-Asian hate nationally. Um, of course, the International District is no exception. Um, and, uh, you know, anti-Asian racism is also nothing new. I mean, of course, it existed well before the virus, um, but it's like that, you know, virus has reactivated these centuries of um, stereotypes and racism around Asian folks and Chinatowns in particular. Um, so one example um, of what's been seen in the International District lately um, uh, there were a group of men with um, dark sunglasses and face coverings that were going around the neighborhood and uh, plastering stickers on businesses and signs and statues and uh, apparently they were with a white nationalist hate group called Patriot Front um, so that you know definitely contributed to a lot of residents just feeling um, unsafe or that they might be victims of uh, anti-Asian violence. And it is feared that as the stay-at-home orders are lifted and there's more folks out you know, interacting in public that there's the potential that anti-Asian hate and violence um, could just increase. There's also been some potentially racially motivated vandalism in small businesses in the international district. And um, you know, some of this has led to uh, calls for more policing and more private security from some folks. And um, that's also problematic because um, a lot of folks in the neighborhood don't necessarily feel safe with increased police presence. And we know that police profiling disproportionately targets and criminalizes black and brown and unhoused community members. Um, there's also been sweeps of unhoused folks in the ID. There was one today and another one planned tomorrow, um, which is a particularly brutal form of displacement. And uh, we believe that it's also unsafe from a public health perspective and CDC guidelines and just an unacceptable from a human rights perspective. And so we've had to do some very rapid response work around that. Um, just, you know, in the last couple of days. Um, we had some CID coalition members actually go and witness the sweep today on King Street. And, you know, apparently there were over 50 police and city staff present and they were throwing away belongings and just a handful of folks that were, um, you know, offering to provide services. And contrary to what we had heard from the city, there were no options provided to move people into um, safe uh, housing options where folks can social distance like hotels and motels. Um, so because that's so top of mind <laughs> for us, uh, I just wanted to, to mention that and we invite you to check out um, our petition calling for alternative to sweeps in the ID uh, in the form of better sanitation and services and individual and permanent housing options. Um, and there's a link to our petition and some more resources on that on our CIDcoalition.com website. Um, another recent concern related to COVID-19 is disaster gentrification. And we know that disasters, of course, don't discriminate, but it does 
they do amplify existing inequalities. So what do we mean by disaster gentrification? Um, well, one example of this is what happened post-Katrina, um, where the natural disaster accelerated the replacement of poor and people of color by the much more affluent and by forces that you know, exploited these disasters um, into an opportunity for themselves. Um, this also happened in Seattle uh, during the, or after the 2001 Nisqually earthquake, um, which displaced residents from several unreinforced masonry buildings in the CID. And according to code, those buildings can only be um, reoccupied after expensive structural upgrades. And the owners of these buildings, like they, you know, don't have the support or the resources to do that. So they kind of prime these buildings for, um, for flipping or redevelopment. And I'll, uh, yeah, turn over to Marlon for another um, example around disaster gentrification. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Cynthia. And um, one thing that I want to talk about with disaster gentrification is, like Cynthia mentioned, is that, of course, disasters don't discriminate, but they certainly reamplify so much of the existing inequities. Uh, we've seen this in Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, and this the ever more frequent natural disasters happening across our nation and our world. Uh, one thing to note too is that the the disaster and it's is maybe natural or out of our hands, but the effects and the economic recovery are definitely because of social structures we set up, and we are witnessing that folks who are much much better off and um, really thrive off predatory speculation and the fact that we're less better off in the neighborhood is. Um, they are gaining even, they're trying to gain even more power during this pandemic. Uh, one example is that the in the city of Seattle's legislation, where they tried to accommodate the new stay at home reality, um, we've seen developers lobby heavily to the city council to allow for a design review to happen over the administrative means or via electronic means of public input. Um, it's a, design review is a little bit different for us here in the Chinatown International District because the previous rounds of organizers, the previous generations, have fought for the International Special Review District. So we have a uh, mostly democratically elected board um, of design reviewers who, who are responsible um, by law, by city law to protect the historical, cultural, and economic character of our neighborhood and the uniqueness of the Pan-Asian nature that we've cultivated over generations. Um, anyways, to sidestep that uh, through um, electronic means when we know that much of the folks in the CID may not have digital literacy, let alone English literacy, and we know that in, um, internet means are a way to pretty much disempower many of them. Um, they're just trying to push the project ahead because they've had so little success doing so in the traditional sense, and they're taking advantage of the pandemic to do so. Um, aside from that, we've seen, as we've always seen in the CID, the community step up to the occasion. Uh, we have uh, mutual aid um, by some CID coalition members are part of the larger Seattle COVID-19 mutual aid network, which is trying to reach folks that the government does not, um, especially undocumented folks in our communities. Uh, so far, they've raised over $250,000 in grassroots donations and are coordinating volunteers to do food deliveries to elders, give direct cash assistance, and support people like farm workers up in Bellingham who are not covered by the federal relief. Um, moreover, uh, we know that the CID is a very politically complex place. Uh, there's a lot of people there who frankly test Cynthia and I's patients. But one thing that I'm really proud of is that our neighborhood has really come together for weekly coordination calls uh, where we're stepping up and filling the void that the federal, state, and local governments aren't. Um, all the nonprofits and the community groups and people with deep roots and doing business there are coming together to solve these uh, daily rapid response issues, including uh, doing food deliveries from food banks to our elders in our nonprofit housing developments. Um, uh, moreover, one thing I want to note about the CID coalition and COVID mutual aid and a lot of what's happened in the grassroots in the CID in the South and the past that decisions are made democratically and with accountability to our communities to better ensure that lived experiences are accounted for and to ensure equitable outcomes for the communities that are actually affected. Uh, communities responding in very creative ways. Oh, sorry, did I take your part, Cynthia? Nope. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of them is here is the Jade Garden murals that we see after uh, what Cynthia mentioned was potentially racist, potentially racist motivated vandalism. Um, is artists really stepping up to the plate uh, with covering up the floorboards. And we've seen this in a lot of Seattle, which is really great. Uh, moreover, uh, we have seen artists really step up, like here's Moni Chow's art um, to show, um, to really bring a sense of solidarity and pride to the resilience we all have in the neighborhood. And also the Wing Luke Museum, along with a lot of other national arts and culture groups of the API community are collecting love letters to the CID. And um, one thing that I really want to circle back to is all of this resilience has existed before the pandemic because of all of the discrimination, explicit and implicit, that has also existed before the pandemic. Uh, we know that it is estimated that um, this is all going to worsen the people who are already affected and POC and immigrant communities hit the hardest. Um, up to 90% of women in POC owned businesses right now, for example, don't have access to the Paycheck Protection Program. That was as a part of the original round of federal aid. Um, we are just exasperating inequalities that have already existed and we cannot go back to normal. We need to have not just a revolution, but an evolution from how we do things today. We need truly systemic change to make sure that the future will be not just more efficient, but frankly, more just and equitable. I wanna hand it back to Cynthia real quickly to give some shout outs. Thanks Marlon. Um, yeah, so we're just uh, getting up to um, the closing of our presentation. Um, not quite an hour, sorry, but <laughs> we'll have more time for Q&A. Um, but we did want to give some shout outs to um, folks that we work with um, and other, you know, partners that are working for systemic change. Um, there's a lot of people in our coalition that also organize in other spaces and groups, or there's groups that we've partnered with on specific campaigns, um, like Save Bush Garden. So just to give a shout out to some other groups and to check them out. Um, Parasol, we work very closely with um, API Chaya, Got Green, APIs for Black Lives, Africa Town, Interim, Puget Sound Sage, Historic Seattle, Unite Here, and the Artist Coalition for Equitable Developments are just some um, other amazing groups that we're really uh, privileged to be able to partner with. Thanks, Cynthia. And I see Nikki, who I happen to have the pleasure of working with, asking a few different questions. But uh, one of them that I want to point out is in the chat, I sent a link to bit.ly slash say the COVID history cafe. Um, we are posting links to things like the mutual aid, if you want to help out with that, how to volunteer in the neighborhood, if you are um, able and capable to do so, uh, your safety and health is our top priority, and also some more resources if you want to learn more. Uh, one of those is by um, a very powerful woman I very much respect. Um, she is a professor of urban planning and really inspired me to get involved in planning despite all the harms planning has done. Uh, to our communities, but Dr. Marie Rose Wong has written this book called Building Tradition, uh, Pan-Asian Seattle and Life in the Residential Hotels. Um, that's in that link that I sent you all. Um, also, if you want to get involved with grocery, food, and mass delivery, we, you can contact Mary Kate at the Seattle Chinatown International Business Preservation Development Authority, or we call it SCIDPA, and she's M-A-R-Y-K-A-T-E-R at C-I-D-P-D-A dot org. And you can also stay in touch with us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you all. Follow us on Facebook, check out our website, sent you a link. Um, some more books too. Um, Cynthia's holding up The Gang of Four, Four Leaders, Four Communities, One Friendship by Bob Santos and Gary Iwamoto. Um, you can also uh, go online and check out Segregated Seattle by the UW Civil Rights and History Project. Uh, right. Oh no. Well, I think I have to go, Cynthia. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow, say by the bell, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we'll be safe. Is that a fire alarm? Okay, all right, well, I guess come back if you can, but if you cannot, no worries. I'm going to try to hop onto my phone once I get outside. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks, Marlon. Thank you, Marlon. Please be safe. Thank you, Cynthia. 
Um, for everyone listening in, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box down at the bottom um, and I will make sure to route them to the panelists. Um, one of them we've already been talking about is what can the neighborhood community do to support the CID during the COVID crisis? Um, and so if you haven't been watching the chat, people have been dropping a lot of links in there. So be sure to do that. But uh, Cynthia, do you have anything uh, that you would add that hasn't come up yet of how people can get involved both um, in the long and short term? Yeah, I mean, so I see some questions too, uh, requesting um, the titles of the books we listed. I know we kind of rattled off um, a lot of different <laughs> um, resources to follow up on. So if you go to CIDcoalition.com or that uh, bit.ly link that Marlon put in there, we have a list of those books and we also um, listed some of the sh shorter term rapid response volunteer opportunities that folks can engage in. Um, around food and mask and grocery delivery and who to contact to do that. Um, and then I'd say, uh, yeah, like just stay in touch with us, um, shoot us an email, follow us on Facebook, send the CID Coalition a message because we are at any given time holding and working on a lot of different campaigns and the way we do our work is just through organizing and people power and allies and sometimes we might you know do mobilizations or it helps for folks to show up or to um, send an email to their city council member and um, so the more folks that we can get in touch with and um, build relationships and community with um, I think it's just it's it's a it's a long game right um, so just building that that base, I think, is going to help for some of that longer term change. Thank you. Um, a question on what kinds of development you would like to see in the CID, as far as what, having talked about what kind of development you'd like to um, oppose, um, what, what is it? Thank you for coming back, Marlon. Welcome back. Um, what is it that you would ideally like to see? Yeah, well, maybe I can jump in and then Marlon, if you want to, um, yeah, add on. Because <laughs> um, I know you're navigating uh, a few different things right now, it seems like. <laughs> um, yeah, so as Marlon mentioned earlier, we're not against development, like full stop. We're not against development per se. It's really about what type of development is it? Who does it serve and who does it not? Um, so I think it's pretty, hopefully, <laughs> pretty clear from the presentation that, you know, generally for-profit speculative development that is out of the, the reach of um, folks who are in the ID, working class folks, uh, families, seniors, and that's going to contribute over the immediate or the long term to gentrification and displacement like we're not we're not about that but we are for development that um, does meet community needs and you know we've run several listening posts and community sessions to inform like what those um, needs are right we didn't just like come up with them like they're from uh, directly from community input and um, like the Bush Garden vision that Marlon was mentioning earlier, like that's an example of um, a vision to preserve the Bush Garden vision and or the Bush Garden building that has over a century of Asian American history. And then also on the adjoining lot, which the developer also owns, um, that instead of a 17 story um, luxury high rise, um, that's market rates, we would like to see low income housing for families and seniors that, that can have community space and cultural space. Um, so that that is a type of development that we would like to see. We've been in favor of developments like Uncle Bob's Place, that interim is developing on the site of the Four Seas restaurant that was done in partnership with the longtime, um, with the Chan family, who, you know, longtime Chinese American fam family that owned that site. So, um, yeah, if we think development can be done well, <laughs> and that's, you know, this kind of stuff that we're for. Um, but yeah, Marlon, if, uh, let's see if you had anything to, to add on. 
Yeah, Cynthia, real quickly, sorry, I'm on my phone now. What was the question exactly? Uh, the question was, what development do you want to see? So um, there was a point where you're talking about visioning that you're not anti-development, but that you're pro-community, um, community collaborative type of development. And what does that look like? Like, what are the projects that the community would like to see in the CID? Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. I think one thing that's really important that I want to highlight and is prevalent in New York and a lot of other cities here in the U.S., um, is that we uh, have community-owned land where the real estate underwards isn't owned by the public or the nonprofit or a for-profit developer, but we actually have land that is democratically governed and permanently affordable and that also serves local mom-and-pop businesses. I think just having community-controlled land and getting out of the speculative market is the most, um, is the most effective thing we can do in both our COVID-19 state of emergency and the homelessness state of emergency. Thank you. Uh, we actually have a question specifically for you, Marlon. Um, as a government agency employee, what advice do you have for other folks working in government agencies who want to support community efforts and vision? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's something I struggle with myself a little bit too, is balancing all the different interests inside my heart and my mind. And nothing is ever so simple, but I'd say uh, just do what you can, uh, follow your heart, and um, trust that everything will be just fine. Um, somebody wanted to know if you could expand on what community land owned land is and how that can be used for affordable and culturally relevant development. Sure thing. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight as a model, there's lots of different models, is a community land trust um, and more specifically a limited equity cooperative. That's where the land is removed from the market. It's owned by an organization that is democratically governed by their tenants and other nonprofit members who have a stake. And um, the land on top, I mean, the structures on top of the land can be rented out or they could be uh, um, in and of themselves affordable housing run by the same organization and people can only resell their stake of that land for um, an affordable price, which is pretty much what they paid, plus escalation and inflation. Um, this includes the Douglas Community Land Trust, which is new in Washington, D.C. Um, there's a bunch in Chinatown, San Francisco. New York City has a ton of them. And one of the oldest ones that actually has the power of eminent domain is in Boston. Thank you. Uh, somebody asked if something like this already exists in the CID, or is this something that would be something that hasn't hasn't existed in the past yet not to my knowledge um but yeah i think that would be something that we would definitely like to see realized um i know africa town has done work around um alternative models to you know the free market capitalist <laughs> housing as commodity structures. I mean, they have Africa Town Land Trust. They did a lot, did a lot of great, a lot of great work around Liberty Bank. And um, yeah, you know, definitely we have a lot. Um, we uh, can learn from them or in a conversation with them, but I think it would be awesome to see something that was um, community owned, uh, like a land trust. Yeah, Thank definitely, you. Cynthia. And uh, we do have land trusts I think we have one in the CID specifically, but they don't have uh, um, a limited equity portion where owners are able to build some wealth, which was denied to POC communities through redlining and racial roots of covenants. Thank you. Another question, um, somebody asked at one point, uh, there was a mention of a homeless camp sweep that had just taken place. And um, this person wanted to know why was there a sweep? <laughs> um, sorry, I just put the, the link to the, is it the Dudley Street Collaborative is the one in Boston, Marlon? That's yeah, right. So, okay. That organization has 3,000 members. Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know like where to start exactly with the, the recent sweeps. I think maybe just to sum it up in a nutshell um, that, you know, the CID community just like any community is not a monolith and there are um, 
political and philosophical differences um, uh, around dealing with challenges, including um, our, you know, the unsheltered neighbors uh, that we have and um, what the best course of action is around that. Um, I think that there, I mean, there have been growing encampments in the international district. A lot of folks are thinking that since the sweeps happened in Ballard, I mean, there's nowhere to, for folks to go. So um, one of the places that they end up coming is an international district. Um, and there are concerns about um, around public health, public safety, economic recovery, which are all legitimate concerns and that we share in the concern for um, uh, having a situation where all three of those things are, um, uh, yeah, where we have a neighborhood where uh, public health and safety and economic recovery happen as quickly as possible. Um, but, you know, I think some folks in the community where we're just really pushing for um, them to be kind of disposed of and displaced in an expedient a manner as possible unfortunately and that's not something that we agree with um, but you know some groups and folks might have more louder voices and more access um, and putting more pressure on the city um, so that's something that we've just been trying to counteract and provide a you know counter narrative to show that like not everybody in the international district is on the same page about that marlon did you want to add anything sure um I also want to add that sweeps cost upwards of $8 million every year, and they have, I think, about 0% effectiveness proven, as in getting people into stable housing, while we spend around $3 million every year in tiny homes, and tiny homes have gotten over 500 people last year into stable housing. So it just doesn't make sense that we continue to invest in sweeps that are inhumane and frankly violent and that we just don't focus on safe shelter and safe housing. Thank you. And thanks, Molly. You're like a total rock star for <laughs> <laughs> so like jumping in with the awesome answers and like dealing with the fire drill and yeah, Marlon's a total rock star. <laughs> Seconded. Um, next question uh, and kind of related to some uh, themes you just brought up is how do you navigate dissenting community sentiments, particularly those who do not want to see more affordable housing and conversely want to see more market race rate housing? Was it how do we navigate that? Yeah, how, mm -hmm. uh, how do you na navigate dissent within the community as far as how to handle uh, things? like yeah. development, people who do want market rate versus affordable housing? I mean, it is a reality and not everyone is gonna, you know, agree about these things all the time. I mean, I think we do a fair amount of community education and outreach. That's something that we're always trying to do in the course of um, our organizing. Um, I mean, the coalition, we're, uh, we try to stay grounded in our, in our principles to act as a framework and kind of a North Star about when you have a contentious issue or there's people in the community that you're close to or you care about. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's a small, um, close-knit community, right? And so we may be disagreeing with our neighbors and our family members and our elders and folks that we respect. Um, but I think we keep coming back to um, our principles and our accountable love ethic that we have to each other within the coalition and also what we, you know, believe is the um, most just and equitable way to push forward. So, yeah, I don't necessarily know that I have like a great answer for that. I mean, it's a learning experience for, for all of us, but we just have to, you know, um, be realistic that that's going to be a part of the process and, you know, still try to hold those tensions and um, hold each other in that, that love, you know, and mutual respect. Marla, do you wanna add? Oh, okay, all good. <laughs> Um, maybe while we're waiting to see if he 
comes back. Uh, somebody also asked about the Wajamaya Corporation and the community center they're building and whether or not they're part of the coalition or collaborating. Um, I'm not aware of a community center they're building. Um, I know they have a proposed Fujimatsu development on Jackson and Fifth, I believe. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I will say they've been uh, in the camp of being quite supportive of um, private market rate development because that seems to be a goal of theirs um, and opposed to uh, development that's more centered on like low income and accessible housing. So yeah, there I would not say that we um, work with them. <laughs> um, but we're, yeah, it's, it's, you know, everything is a little complicated, but yeah. Thank you. Another question was uh, that in the presentation you had noticed th noted that some in the community are having a hard time getting access to the stimulus checks um, and wondering what's being done to help with that. Uh, I can jump in, Cynthia. Yeah, so um, one thing that we're doing to help with that, well, not we the coalition, but some of our members in the COVID mutual aid, um, is to raise grassroots money not controlled by 501c3 or the state to really focus our efforts on the folks who need the relief the most. And that's what we're doing in addition to food deliveries, in addition to groceries, et cetera, et cetera, is just relying on mutual aid rather than hoping for it to come from someone else. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, someone wants to know how the community can counteract the effects of the coming uh, transportation hub light rail that's going to arrive from Bellevue. I think this is a Marlin question. <laughs> <laughs> I am sorry, I don't think I can answer that. <laughs> oh, I see, yeah. <laughs> I think it'd be unfair to both the coalition, the community, and my employer, Sound Transit. Yeah, oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I'm not like totally caught up with where exactly. I mean, I think a lot of that conversation and that process kind of got derailed, no pun intended, um, by COVID. Um, I think there's some community efforts around having more say in where that station is going to be located, right? So um, yeah, Marlon, I wish you could comment more on this because I know you're much more knowledgeable, but <laughs> I would say to be, to be determined, um, there are folks in the community that are, um, that are working on that issue. Um, and it's definitely, you know, could have huge impacts, including potential displacement on a lot of local small businesses, depending on where they decide to end up locating that station. Um, and hopefully, you know, it's not just the location, but it's like, what would a station look like in terms of um, what's included there? Like, could it have affordable commercial space? Could there be services so it's not just like another way to get from point a to point b but you know you'll see in other cities where um transportation stations um you know do serve a greater good and a, a bigger function um in terms of like being more of a holistic community hub right thank you um Okay, I guess one more. <laughs> and then I think we should call it a night. Um, but the question is, as the city moves to reopen, especially restaurants, has the CID coalition taken a position on the proposal to allow businesses to use city right of way in the form of streeteries? Um, and I think to broaden that, um, what are what are thoughts on how to support the community um, as reopening starts, like how, how can people support small businesses and the restaurants um, in ways that uh, are, you know, economically supportive, but still safe um, as, as the reopening starts to begin?
if I can just jump in. I think one thing that we, the coalition, are uh, looking at, especially when we talk a little bit about the COVID, I mean, the sweeps of encampments as it relates to COVID, is that we uh, really, at least when it came to that front, we really wanted to put our hearts um, in alignment with our values, but also with the best available knowledge. And I think that um, we are just supportive of the best available public health guidance. Yeah, and I would say that there's, um, uh, you know, ways that you can support uh, small business regardless of, um, you know, if you, like what the reopening stages look like. Um, I mean, a lot of business have been reopening just for um, takeout and delivery. Um, there's also been more creative community responses about um, around like raising money to um, pay restaurants to then get, get meal de meals delivered to frontline workers. Um, there's some small business relief funds. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think in general, just um, uh, trying to, you know, use your agency with how folks choose to spend their dollars every day. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to support small businesses um, right now and through all stages of the reopening. Thank you. And thank you so much to Cynthia Brothers and Marlon Herrera. Please, everyone, give them a virtual round of applause wherever you are um, for all the knowledge that they have shared. Um, and take a look in the chat. There's so many great resources that are there before you log off. Um, thank you so much to both of you. Um, and thank you to so many of you for joining us tonight. Um, please join us for our next virtual program. It's going to be on June 6th. It's a Saturday at 5 p.m. It's going to be with the Northwest African American Museum. And the topic is Know Your Vote, What is Democracy in America? It's going to be with moderator Moni Tepp and guest Jeanette Cordova. Um, if you learned something new or enjoy the work we are doing during this unprecedented time in history, please, please consider making a gift to Mohai or becoming a member to support future programs and to help sustain the museum behind this closure. Um, as you exit Zoom, you will be taken to our donation page uh, that will be popping up. So if you can, we really ask to consider making a gift. With that, I bid you all good evening. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to continuing to connect with you digitally. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks everyone for joining, appreciate you.